Good morning once again. You are listening to Dennis O'Connor from Awakening in Health. And I am with a gentleman called Zev Freeman this morning, who is going to talk to us about things legal and or lawful. And uh, I started a bit of a journey a few years back looking into some people a little bit like Zev and his work. And initially, we kind of think that uh, some of the things that people like Zev do are maybe they're 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 a little bit crazy. And but people like Zev, what they're doing is they really are challenging some of the principles that we are led to believe are set in stone. And these principles are not set in stone. And a really good example of that might be when we had uh, over the last three years, these absolutely crazy things that were happening down in Melbourne where people's right, rights were absolutely stripped away from them. And uh, they were essentially living in a, a tyrannical state. So, uh, Zev, thank you very much for jumping on my show this morning with me and welcome to Awakening the Health. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you for the invite too, mate. Um, well, look, let's jump straight into it then, shall we? Um, and look, always when I'm talking about such complex topics as the law and our rights, we, ne we need to start with the basics so people can really comprehend um, how and why and where some of this all started to go so pear-shaped for we the people. And also like to sort of, which I'll elaborate on shortly with you, the difference between our rights and the law. Now, our rights are your inherent inalienable rights. We get these the moment we take our first breath. They are, depending on your religious or spiritual persuasions or beliefs, they are your God-given or your natural-born rights. And that is the only authority that can remove those rights from us is in the God or nature. And ultimately, that's where we come from. Uh, the statutes, for example, did not create us. Therefore, they lack the authority over we, the people. And this comes to our very basic setup of the, uh, the hierarchy of law, let's say. We have God or nature, which created man, and then man created government. That which we create cannot have authority over us without our consent, much in the same way we as people do not get authority above God or nature. It works the same. And this is the basic principle where we come undone. Just just to jump in for a second, Zev, what, what started you on this journey? Because obviously I've heard you a good bit, a bit of your stuff before. You're very passionate and, you know, you, you just uh, really, I guess, uncover some really, really, um, you know, th things that, that we can question and that make, make people think. What got you? What got you to where you are now? Well, look, I've been been uh, operating in the law space and how I put it, uh, challenging the system, so to speak over the discrepancies, inequalities, and dare I say it, fraud, and lack of basis in law and a lot of the uh, establishment's claims. Now, I'm 47 years old at the moment, Dennis, and I started doing this sort of stuff back when I was 18, 19. Now, how I started to learn about some of this, that things were not exactly as we're told, and as I learnt more, I realised they're pretty much almost the opposite of how we're told the law works is actually how it is. It's quite opposite and backwards. So as a, as a young fellow back at the age of 19, roughly, I was protecting the environment and uh, assisting our Indigenous and the tribes with the protection of their cultural sacred sites and, and sites that were cultural heritage based and for the environment as well. And I did this by uh, chaining myself to trees and bulldozers. I'm not talking protesting or waving banners in the streets because I believe that to be highly ineffective. Um, but when you're actually out on site, we're out in remote areas completely off grid living on the mine sites and hiding in the bush so we could pop out wherever to block roads and disrupt their works. We had court cases in play to get injunctions and things, but these mining companies, for example, logging companies, the same, we try and get beyond the point um, that we had them in court to stop them from. So when we went to court in three months, the work that we were attempting to get an injunction against was already completed. So we would go out on site to these remote areas and lock down the roads. And we do this with a variety of methods, such as tree sits and large tripods and attaching ourselves to trees and bulldozers with various uh, chains and metal devices that were very hard to remove us from. Now, when you're chaining yourself to trees and bulldozers or you're sitting 60 or 80 foot in the air up a tree and they come to get you, you don't have the ability to run away. You're sitting duck and you're going to get arrested and you will have your day in court. And it's through these days in court that I started to learn that the law was not what we were told. So as I started learning more about this a little over 25 years ago, my curiosity was piqued and I decided that if I'm really going to learn how this works properly, the only way to test it is a trial by fire. Therefore, I need to go to court to test what it is that I was learning. 
best way to go to court is to get yourself arrested. So I found myself deliberately getting myself arrested at some of these uh, blockades and protests when there was no need to be arrested for the sole reason that I wanted to see if what I was learning was actually effective. Lo and behold, it was very effective. I haven't lost a court case for myself since 2004. So it was through doing this, I got a lot of practice and it's through that practice. And I wasn't always successful when I started doing this, but it didn't deter me. It made me realize I need to learn more and come back strong. So, so on your journeys, Ev, you, 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 we, I think we start out, and I think a lot of people are still in that mind frame where the, the court and the judges and the magistrates and the solicitors, they're these daunting, I guess, superiors to us who tell us what to do. And if we don't do it, then we, we wear the brunt of it. And there's also a kind of, a, I guess, an assumption. But when we look into it, it's a very inaccurate assumption that, that uh, this, the, the system is based on this thing called justice. Um, would that would that be a fair comment or not? Well, look, for our perception of it, what we're taught and told is that, yes, if you go to court, you go there to attain justice. But in my experience of 25 plus years and, and having a lot of court days, the courts are not set up for justice. They're set up for commerce and business. And can you give us some examples of that? So, so I mean, what, what would be, I guess, some of the things that, that would have really got got under your skin and, and driven you to, I guess, take the assertive stand that you take now? Well, let's look at some of the blockading. We are um, at the back of Tenerfield with the Timbara gold mine, for example, and this is the mid late 90s to give uh, your listeners an idea on the time frame as to when we were doing this. Um, they are wanting to extract the gold out of the rock. Now, they're only getting around 0.7 of a gram per tonne. So that dig up 40 tonnes of earth to make an ounce of gold. And back then, gold was only worth a couple hundred dollars an ounce, not like it is today. None of us can see the cost effectiveness and what they're doing. And the damage to the environment and to the sacred sites for the local tribes out there was going to be insane. And we couldn't understand how it added up let alone the fact that they wanted to use something like 70,000 tonnes of caustic soda and all these other nasty chemicals to try and leach the gold out. And this was done in a high-altitude wetland, and there's only a few of these in the world that are over a kilometre above sea level. And they said it's okay, none of that will leak out of the tailings dams or where we extract it, because we're going to put a one and a half millimetre piece of plastic down to put all the crushed rock on top of that will stop it leaking into the waterways and the swamps, which, without being a geologist or an engineer, any idiot would know if you're going to dump 30 something thousand tons of rock on a one and a half millimeter piece of plastic, that plastic is not going to fare too well. And this was part of our argument, the damage that could have caused to the environment. And we were told that that was all good and above board because we'd done tests. And again, we had court action there. So going to court to challenge them on the environmental grounds, as well as for the activism, we started to learn a lot very quickly that the courts were not at all operating how we've all been taught and told growing up. What we've learned about the court was, in fact, quite the opposite how it worked. And as we started exploring this, we started to find these uh, these loopholes or deficiencies, if you like, in the law. And then as with further study, I started to realise that these loopholes have been deliberately written into the legislation because those who write the legislation don't like to be held accountable to the laws they want us accountable to. So they always leave a, a loophole or a backdoor in the legislation for themselves. I, mean, I can't recall ever seeing politicians or members of the judiciary getting charged in court for committing crimes or breaking the law, although it happens regularly. Why is that? Because they write the loopholes into the legislation for themselves. And my argument for many a year, Dennis, has been we're all created equally and we're all equal before the law. Now, if we're all equal before the law, the question then arises is why aren't we doing it too? Surely those same loopholes and backdoor clauses apply to all of us, not just to a few. That's a, that's a really nice way that you evolved that, Ev. And the, as you're talking there, one of the things that jumps out to me is uh, that the courts really seem to be in bed with the big corporations, their buddies. And as you mentioned before, I don't think at all it is about justice. It's, it's about, uh, I guess, furthering the interests of the people who've got the big bucks. And uh, then, so a very important point that you just made just before I, I kind of cut across you there was um, the fact that you now have are working out or you have at least worked out some things whereby we as as men and women and and uh, you can clarify the definition between people in a second as well for for those people who are not aware of this stuff we can use those same strategies to i guess take our power back would that be a way of saying that well look, we, we never lost our power to have to take it back 
Yeah. And this is a misconception amongst people uh, seeking more freedom for themselves. We have to reclaim our freedom or our sovereignty, but we never lost it. That's so right. what happens is we get tricked and deceived into voluntarily giving it up temporarily or otherwise in exchange for these benefits and privileges instead of our rights. Now, the big difference between law and our rights, Dennis, is our rights are inalienable, as we said earlier, they come from God or nature. So the, the establishment or the government, the system, whatever people want to refer to it as, because they didn't create or give us those rights, they have no authority to remove them or infringe upon them. In fact, no law has the ability or power to infringe upon or remove one's rights. And our rights are not subject to the law. The law is subject to our rights. And yet we see we see our rights being abused, you know, at every turn. And just just in relation to, to I guess, the way the conversation is, is evolving, if could I throw at you the, the, the label or the term that we hear being bandied around sovereign citizen? Would you describe yourself as a so and it's a loaded question and I kind of know where you're going to go with this. But uh, could, would you be described as one of them or as a sovereign citizen? Well, look, I, well, this is a, a common question I, I feel it a lot, Dennis, and I always have a laugh when I hear the term <laughs> sovereign citizen because it is, in fact, one of my three favourite oxymorons. Now, my, my other two being natural person and banking integrity. None of these <laughs> words belong together. Now, the idea of anyone being able to be sovereign and a citizen at the same time is absurd, and the definitions of both sovereign and citizen are quite the opposite to each other. It is legally, lawfully, and physically impossible for anyone to be sovereign and a citizen at the same time. So what exactly does citizen mean, uh, Zev, then? And uh, the, the kind of metaphors and, and the basis of some of these words is actually really fascinating when, when I've been looking into it. But just again, for to, to bring, I guess, listeners up to scratch on that. Well, look, we want to be looking at things like the Citizenship Naturalisation Act of, uh, of 48 and some other citizenship acts that describe what that is. Basically, it means you're a citizen of the particular country, but the way that things have gone with the tricky use of language and uh, the way things have changed over the years, particularly since 1973, that the language has slightly changed. So if you're an Australian citizen, you're more the citizen of what's defined as a corporation or a company as opposed to a landmass or a country. Because technically speaking, we're not Australia here. We are the Commonwealth of Australia. And that has been slowly eroded from a lot of our uh, government documents over time. Same as we seem to have lost our Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia, and we now have an Australian Parliament. Our government of the Commonwealth of Australia has been replaced with an Australian government. Now, these are some tricky terms that they plays on words, if you like, where it sounds the same, but it has an entirely different meaning. And that different meaning also puts these entities, whether they be an Australian government or a government of Australia or a government of the Commonwealth of Australia, puts these entities in different jurisdictions in the eyes of the law as to their limitations as to what they can and can't do with or over we the people. And this and is what and, and this is very much what you're talking about, about uh, the, the little get out of jail cards for the corporations and the industries and the magistrates and the and the QCs or, K, or should I say KCs now, they are aware of these nuances. The average person is not aware of them and they, they bank on people like yourself or myself even not knowing that these tiny little twists and changes to, to, the, to the words in the legislation make a whole lot of difference, which basically disempowers us. Well, it's an attempt to do so until we look at why and how and what they've changed. And was it done lawfully with due process? There are certain rules of engagement, if you like, that our government is supposedly required to uphold and be beholden to by their own legislation and laws. And this is where people like myself who are good at researching are able to bring them undone because we can find holes in their process and show that it was not done by the correct or due lawful process or procedure, in which case it undoes what they've done lawfully speaking and they cannot enforce it anymore. And we've got a whole lot of trickery and deception. Uh, and the, the last three, four years with COVID has been a great example of that, Dennis, to see how they can twist and contort the words of one section of a legislative act or instrument to give it a completely different meaning, even if that meaning is opposite or contrary to the definitions of that particular piece of legislation. And this is where they've caught a lot of people out with, with COVID fines, for example, and various other claims that have been made against people. They've been unable to supply the factual evidence to support the claim. And when these claims have been challenged before the courts, 
in light of the fact that there is no uh, verifiable or valid evidence or facts to support the claim, the claim is then dropped. And then they have to withdraw the claim or the charges against you based on the fact that they haven't applied correct lawful or judicial procedures to enact the fine or enforce it. And the legislation that uh, may or may not have been used in that instance may or may not have been used correctly for that particular situation either. Now, if they've done errors in their application of the law, then they must withdraw the claim and the matter. As so people like me have had a lot of success helping people with some of the more silly COVID fines, which haven't been enacted properly and have been applied incorrectly for the situation. So so really, um, what you're saying is that they are, they do whatever the hell they want until they're caught out. And it's people like and it's people like yourself who who are using their, uh, I, I guess, deception, really, uh, against them to to bring more balance back. I'm going to I'm going to just um, come in from another angle. But um, the, the government here and, and the, the, the legal systems and the tax offices, you know, with uh, they are you know, providing, I guess, society as the way we as uh, the way we see it now. So wh- why why should somebody like yourself threaten the, that fabric of society and bring bring down, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, these 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 supposedly great systems that are keeping the streets safe and that are, I guess, uh, educating our children and that are supplying us with with uh, with with health in the form of hospitals and whatnot. And and you know, rightfully I guess taking, you know, our, our our some of our wages in order to sustain that system and keep that system flowing smoothly. What what gives you the the I guess the the uh, not the authority but but the right to 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 try and disrupt that? And and I've left a lot of holes there for you to to, to pick. Uh, let's clarify a little bit. But look, each I can't speak for anyone else because I'm not anyone else. I can only speak for myself. And just quickly on that note. That was my issue with the voice. How rude and arrogant was it to ask a percentage of Australia to speak on behalf of another? None of us have that right. So clear that one up for you, Dennis. We'll get back to your question now just to point out that it's wrong for anyone to speak on behalf of another because we are not the other. And a great example, by the way, Xavier. Yeah, well, it's not for people like, but again, I can only speak for myself, but for for me individually here, I'm not interested in, in challenging the system or in fighting it. Um, or disrupting it, so to speak, which is how often people like myself are viewed. I, I choose not to be a part of that system and to operate myself autonomously. Now, we have various other laws outside of the legislative acts and instruments here, which are actual laws and not acts, such as our common law or our English common law, as Captain Cook and Arthur Phillip brought here to these lands. Now, for example, under English common law or our common law principles, There is no need for me to provide remedy unless I've caused any harm, loss, damage or injury. So let's say I had, for example, a speeding ticket for driving three kilometres over the limit. My first one of my first questions would be to ask, where is the injured party making a claim for damages? And can I see that verified or bona fide claim for damages? Now, as a man of honour, if I've caused any harm, loss, damage or injury, Dennis, I'm happy to provide the remedy. But in the absence of harm, loss, damage or injury, and there being no injured party coming forward to make a verified claim for damages, it's rather confusing as to why we're asked to provide remedy by way of a financial disbursement in the absence of any harm, loss, damage or injury. Again, if I was speeding past you, I'm not going to have to pay uh, damages for remedy for doing three or five kilometres over the limit when I passed you on the roads. Now, had I run my car into your car and I've caused some damage, that's a different story. I've caused the damage, I'm responsible for that, I therefore must provide the remedy to at very least get your car fixed, if not my own as well for my own need. But if I've caused you to suffer any harm, loss, damage or injury, Dennis, I am liable for that harm, loss, damage or injury and I must provide the remedy. And that's under common law and admiralty or maritime law, those same rules apply. Okay. And and there is a... There is a... Sorry, sir. This is what's missing with the law now is the argument that you were speeding, allegedly... You know, for when you're in court, you're allegedly speeding and therefore could have caused an accident. Therefore, you have to pay the fine. Now, one of my common arguments for that is, well, I'm pretty broke at the moment, too, and I could have robbed a bank that afternoon. But I don't see armed robbery on my list of charges based on the grounds of what if. Where are the facts and evidence of the injured party for me to provide damages to? And this is part of the other point here, Dennis. Good people do not need law to tell them how to act responsibly. 
Most of us were raised right and we know the difference between right and wrong. It's not that hard to just not be a dick and not do the wrong thing. It's pretty straightforward. And if you do do the wrong thing, hey, accidents happen. You provide the remedy for the damage you've caused. But we strive to do things with honour and integrity and to have no intention to cause harm, loss, damage or injury. Not to say it doesn't happen. Again, accidents may occur. And if that's the case and I'm responsible for the accident, then I'm responsible for the remedy. So, so it's interesting because it really, the, I guess, the, the perception sometimes that's bandied around by the mainstream media are people who, who are not starting to look a little bit closer at, at what you're doing. There's really this, this picture of people like yourself um, as, you know, these radical, you know, extremist, you know, outlaws. But essentially what you've just told me there is that, uh, that it seems that you're very principled uh, to do the right thing and and to be a good a good human being, um, or or could would would it be could could you just go into into a, then uh, what the difference between a human being or a man or a woman and a person is because I think a lot of people just uh, you know that that's another trap there isn't it? It's a massive trap and look, a very hot topic for anyone who studies the law and their rights and our freedoms as the confusion amongst these terms now. Unbeknownst to most people, when we're dealing with the courts, for example, they speak in what sounds to all of us like English, but in actual fact, it's not. And they actually use a, a completely separate language that is deliberately designed to be very tricky and deceitful, known as the language called legalese, the language of lawyers, where the same words, we use the same words in legalese and in English, but in legalese and in the courts, they have a completely different meaning. Something so simple, which the courts will often ask you, is do you understand? And when you agree and say, yes, I understand, in, in English, that means I comprehend, I get what you're saying. In legalese, it means you've agreed to stand under their authority. And this is a great example of some of the tricky and deceitful use of the language. So when we look at the language, we've got a discrepancy between English and legalese and the meanings of Obviously, well, I'm going to say usually the definition of man and woman is quite simple, but in today's day and age, that's become quite a convoluted and complex and, uh, dare I say, a politically correct topic. Um, for your listeners, I am not a fan of political correctness. I will call a spade a spade if that's how I perceive it. So to me, we have men and women. The other genders were not involved in the creation of co conception, of conceiving a, a, a baby, for example. That's man and woman that can do that. That has been the way since the since way back in forever when. So I'll try and leave the political correctness out of this and not touch on the other genders there. But we basically have our main two being man and woman. And this is where life comes from. You and I were created courtesy of an act of nature, an actor of God, thanks to our mother and father or a male and female. This is how conception and we were created there, Dennis. So that's the man and woman that can do that. The man and woman is generally what's considered to be a living entity, that which can see, hear and speak, uh, that which can bleed, can breathe, and has arms, feet, and legs. Yep. Now, when we look at person or human being, they're very, very different. So let's let's do human before I get on to the person, because the person will take a bit longer to explain, which is very different to a man or woman. The human being, let's break down the wording of hue, man, and being. So hue and man, hue is the colour or the colour of and man. So a hue man would be the colour of man. Now, if we look up human in some of our dictionaries, legalese or otherwise, it describes the human as a monster. Now, that's quite easy to believe when we look at what we humans have done to the planet and to other life on this planet. I would happily agree that, yes, the humans are by nature are, in fact, a monster with the damage we've done to this planet and other species. That's I'm happy to agree with that term. People might disagree, but if we look these words up in the dictionary, a human is described as a type of monster. And we have the colour of man, and we break down human man, and then we add the word being to it. So we have the colour of man being what? What are we being? Are we a, a being or are we being something? And it's a very confusing and ambiguous use of the language to allow the courts to interpret it in their favour. And it's very... It's, it's important to note as well, Zev, that, uh, that what you're talking about when you say look in the dictionary, people can grab their dictionaries and they're not going to see what you're saying. But in the actual legal dictionaries, what you're saying is absolutely spot on. They, they, they literally define us. If we don't know what they're saying, they're, they're calling us monsters. And if, if, if that's the case, we don't have rights. Well, in today's day and age, it's fantastic, Dennis, because nowadays, due to political correctness and a society of uh, 
how put as politely, snowflakes and rather soft and easily offended people. We now have the rights to identify as whatever we choose. I could identify as an Apache attack helicopter or a toaster if I choose to. And due to political correctness, the police aren't allowed to question me on that because I might be offended. <laughs> now, yes, that's an extreme example, but just to point that out to people, we've got kids identifying as cats and schools are building a separate toilet block with kitty litters or whatever in them so that kids who identify as cats can have their own toilet block. Now, surely right. if kids who aren't allowed to vote or buy cigarettes or alcohol or get a tattoo because they're considered not to be of the, the fit age in order to have the comprehension of their actions can have the right. Surely the rest of us have the rights to identify as whatever we choose, such as a man or a woman. Now, when we look at the person then, and just before I get the person, when you were describing your, your dictionaries here, yes, we can look these terms up in the Oxford or the Macquarie dictionaries, which are the more commonly known ones to most people. But what about our legalese dictionaries, such as our Black's Law, the Bouvier, the Butterworth or the LexisNexis? which all have the legal terms translated into English for us. So for anyone uh, listening in, these are some of your other dictionaries that you can look these other terms up in and see what they mean in the legal world, which is very different to how they how they're interpreted in English. And this is part of where we get brought undone. Absolutely. Lisa, we'll just take a quick break here for uh, just a bit of music. And what we'll do is we'll come right back after the break. I'm talking to Zev Freeman about his mission, I guess, to facilitate a better understanding of our rights and also, I think, to, to hold systems more accountable when they are treating the common people unfairly. Welcome back to Awakening Health. You are listening to Dennis O'Connor and I'm here with uh, Zev Freeman and we are talking about, I guess, uh, the, the flaws in the legal system and how normal people are really uh, wearing the brunt of a lot of unfair things that are that are really going on. And Zev um, is, I stumbled across his work a little while back and uh, I've been looking at some of these of his videos. He might be considered, uh, we just discussed the, the misnomer term of a sovereign citizen or, or maybe far right or whatnot. But really, when we start looking beyond the, the I guess the, the ad hominems that the mainstream media throw around for people like Zev, what we've, what, I, what I'm finding is that there is a lot more to this story. The legal system is based on manipulation and deception. Uh, we are being treated unfairly and people like Zev are actually holding these people to account. Zev, you, just before the break, you, you, we left off about the deception there with the terminology in relation to a man, a woman or, or a person. And we've defined that a person in actual legal terms is not a man or a woman, as crazy as that sounds. So, yeah, just get back onto, onto that topic. <clears throat> well, let's elaborate a little bit on that there, too. It doesn't matter where we look up the word person, whether it be in an English or on Macquarie or in one of our legalese dictionaries, such as our Black's Law, Bouvier, Butterworth, or the LexisNexis. There is no connection between definition of person to a man or woman or to any living entity, or such as a living man or woman. So when we look at the word person, that's what I often do when I'm doing my research is, is I look at the etymology, the origins. Where did the word come from? How was it first used? Yeah, because we go first in time, first in law, or what's first in time is truest in law as per the maxim of law. So the word person actually comes from the Latin word of persona. And this word was derived from when actors would wear a wooden or clay mask and they would take on the persona of the mask by speaking through it and therefore they would become the person. Much in the same way, if I were to wear a Batman mask, it might be deemed that I've become the person Batman, but it is an act because clearly I'm not Batman. And wearing the mask would not make me Batman. I've taken on the persona or the person of Batman by wearing the mask. And so when we look up the definitions of person, it includes a whole host of other entities, which are all what we refer to as non-living such as trust companies, corporations, trustees, any number of other organisations or corporate or uh, non-living or non-physical bodies can be described as a person. But in the definitions of a person, there is no linking to that of a man or a woman or that of a living man or woman. And to the detriment of 99% of our legislation in this country, most of the legislation says a person commits an offence if it all refers to the person. A person shall not do this. A person shall do this. And we have all this tricky, deceitful language where if you challenge that in court, they may agree and say, okay, we'll consent that you're not a person. Then they might try and call you a natural person. 
Again, this is one of my favorite oxymorons because a person was not created naturally. There can be no such thing as a natural person. Now, a person in the definitions in the eyes of the law, a person is what is referred to as a creature of statute or what's otherwise referred to in Latin as an ens legis creature, E-N-S, separate word, L-E-G-I-S. So an ens legis creature or a creature of statute is a creature which derives its existence entirely from the law, legal fiction, or the statutes. Now, as we're all taught from a very early age about the birds and the bees, Dennis, the statutes are not part of that equation as to how we were conceived or created, as we talked about earlier. Now, I myself, as a parent and a father, uh, I don't recall inviting the statutes to the romantic evening between my daughter and daughter's mum and I uh, when my daughter was conceived. The statutes were not invited to that occasion. That was an act of nature, courtesy of a father and mother, in order to conceive a, a baby. The statutes held no part in the creation of we, the living men and women. What the statutes did create, however, was the person, which is the name written in all capitals. And again, that's just poor English grammar to write a noun in all capitals. And again, the use of the all capitals name signifies the person under English grammar. And in accordance with when we're doing legal documents, there are manuals to determine how those documents are prepared to keep some uniformity uh, and uh, how do I put it, some consistency in these documents. So these documents they refer to, to do that is what's called a styles manual. So we have our Australian styles manual, the UK styles manual. We have international UN uh, editorial styles manuals and the Chicago styles manual, which is also often referred to for all that as well, as to how a document is to be prepared uh, to have any uh, legal standing or basis and what's accepted in that world in that format. When we start to incorporate all this information, we can realise the person is not the living man or woman. It is a creature of statute. It is quite literally a name. It doesn't have arms, feet or legs. It cannot see, hear or speak. And generally speaking, as a result of which that person, that fictitious entity, which only exists on paper, is going to have a very hard time committing an offence. And it's going to be very hard for anyone to prove that a name or something that exists on paper was capable of committing the offence as opposed to the man or woman who may have actually committed the offence. And when we see the, the police pulling over some of these people and they're getting out the car and they're, they're saying, I'm not a person, they are, they're far from crazy, aren't they? They're actually showing that they have an understanding of some of these rules that uh, are being used in those systems. And the other very important thing is the, the, the consistency and the uniformity of all the paperwork uh, it's another get out of jail card. And if you we we assume that that these documents are set out and we even assume sometimes that we can actually read the documents. But often they're, they're just graphics that we see, which uh, which actually don't mean anything. And when you're challenging these basics, uh, they, it, it can really help if you're in an adverse situation with the courts to actually know about this. Would that be right? Well, yes. And look, where a lot of people go wrong, we see a lot of these horror videos of people who have some idea that something's not right. And that, yes, it's very hard for them to prove that we're a person and not a man. That's a very difficult one to feel. But where in my eyes and my views on this one, Dennis, where a lot of people go wrong attempting to exercise this and articulate it when faced with a confrontational situation, such as dealing with the police or the courts, for example, they make a lot of claims and they get quite aggressive when they do so. Now, the police are well trained to deal with aggression. Some of them even enjoy dealing with it because it means they're now allowed to get aggressive in response. But if we remain very calm and polite and we speak to these people, and remember, guys, they're just people. They might wear a uniform, but at the end of the day, they're just people. If you cut them, they bleed the same colour blood that we all do. Again, we're all equal and we're all equal before the law. The clothing you wear does not differentiate that. People are making claims instead of asking questions, Dennis. And this is where they're coming undone. And there's a very old and ancient maxim of law which states that the onus or burden of proof lies on the one making the claim, or that the burden of proof lies on he who affirms, not he who denies. So when we're making claims that we're a man or a woman, the burden of proof is on us to prove it. The easier way of doing that is to ask the police or the courts if they see you as a person and they say, yes, you're a person before the law. Well, in that case, they have now made the claim. It's up to them to provide the proof of. Now, someone to prove that you're a person is going to be pretty much impossible going by our definitions of the word person, which doesn't include a living entity. 
So you're saying that uh, that uh, it's you're on you're on very dubious or, or or dangerous grounds to a certain extent if you are making the claim because then you've got to substance substantiate what you're saying. So you always try and reverse that situation, and you you uh, you know, I guess kind of have the situation where a claim is being made against you, and then the other party has to basically try and work out what they're saying. Would that be right? Okay, and and you just mentioned there. We, 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 what we need to do is to learn to ask better questions. When we ask better questions, we get better answers. And you mentioned there... The right answer is because we didn't ask the right question. Absolutely. And you mentioned there are maxims of law. Just again, for some of our listeners, what, what are maxims of law and why are they important? Maxims of law is uh, come from a lot of old case law from, say, up to a 1,000 years or more ago, where these are the science of philosophy, or in legal terms, it's called the jurisprudence the jurisprudence of law, the science and the philosophy. These are um, the the base establishments, if you like, the foundation of what our laws are based on come from these maxims of law. And that's a very old and ancient one that if you make the claim, then the burden of proof is on you to provide proof of that claim. If you cannot provide proof, facts or evidence of your claim, then the claim becomes questionable and may be very, very easy to shoot down to the point where the claim now has to be withdrawn or, or dropped or dismissed or discharged due to it cannot be proven. It's just an allegation. I can uh, make an allegation, for example, Dennis, that you now owe me a million dollars. Now, I'm going to have a very hard time making proof of that claim in order to enforce it. And uh, a few things there spring to mind. So if, if you did make that claim that uh, you owed me uh, sorry, I owed you a million dollars. And if if you make that claim on a, on a few different occasions, namely three, and if I don't answer you in any way, what happens? Well, look, this this comes to a jurisdictional matter under our maritime and admiralty law. Consent may be implied or manufactured, and we have another maxim which may also say that silence is acquiescence or silence is agreement. You've acquiesced or agreed to the terms by way of your silence. And this is commonly used against we the people when you're you get a fine from say Spur or Revenue New South Wales fines Victoria or the expiation office if you're in South Australia, they'll say if you do not do this this and this within 28 days then the following will occur, and you ignore the fine until 30 days and you ring up after 30 days to pay it, and you're scratching your head as to why the amount has now doubled. No, no, I was ringing it up to pay it. What do you mean it's gone up to 500 from 300? What, what, what? Well, sir, we did tell you in our correspondence sent to you that if you didn't respond or do any of this within 28 days, the following fees would now be applicable. We haven't heard from you. You haven't contested it. You haven't said no. Therefore, your consent and agreement has now been implied. And we warned you that we would do that too. Now this is the case. For people who find themselves in that situation with un with unfair fines, and even if they've kind of left it on a late side, is there anything they can do? Well, look, there are certain things we can do. Look, the best thing to do with a fine for anyone, even if you don't feel you're up to it, is to elect to go to court. Now, if everybody who ever received a fine anywhere in Australia elected to go to court, they would have to change our so-called judicial system, where it might actually be focused on justice instead of commerce. And it might actually get a fairer system for we the people. But the courts are already so backed up with people making claims because they feel they've been done harshly or poorly or wronged by with the way that these fines have been issued and, and it attempted to be enforced. So there is some remedy that can be attained there, but we need to do a bit of learning and research and learn where it is they've gone wrong with the issuing or the attempted enforcement of these fines. And then we can hold them to account to the very laws they're trying to hold us to account to based on, the again, the same principle that we're all equal before the law. So you're saying that that, that, that there is actually a lot that people can do uh, in, re in relation to those situations, but you don't go in there, uh, you know, half cocked without having a decent understanding. And that's something that you actually do a little bit as well, Zev, is to, is to try and help people out in situations uh, where, where people have been treated unfairly by the system. Could you give us a few examples of... of you know, what, what kind of people you, you might be dealing with and, and how you help them? Oh, well, look, Dennis, we get a variety of strange requests for help from people from, or not just in Australia, but from other parts of the world as well, depending on what that matter is pertaining to. Um, deal with a lot of people who have um, got some bad debts that shouldn't be there, for example, stuff where contracts have been changed in the absence of consent and the banks or the financing company are asking for three times the interest rate of the original amount. 
and not playing ball and not being held to account under commercial or contract or Australian consumer laws. That's a, a common one that we deal with to help people uh, deal with some of their debts. And look, just to be clear to everyone listening, I, I'm not a get out of jail free card sort of a guy. I help people who have been wronged. I do not help people who have done the wrong thing. Good people come to with, 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 with a drink driving thing and they've had an accident, mate, you should have been behind the wheel while you were half cut or pissed anyway. You've done the wrong thing. I can't help you. If you've gone and beaten someone up, you're looking for assault charges. I'm not the guy to come to you for help. You've done the wrong thing. You've caused harm, loss, damage, or injury. Put your big boy pants on and be responsible for your actions. You know, but when people have been wronged, that's when people like me step up and advocate for them to help them seek remedy where, where they have been wronged by the system for being treated poorly or harshly or unjustly or unfairly. Excellent. And uh, listen, what I want to do, if I can, Zev, is if you don't mind, I'd love to continue the conversation, but I'm in a shortish slot on the radio, so I might finish up for the radio section and then we'll continue the chat. Anybody who's listening to the radio station can find this, the, all this talk and the next part of it on my social media. And Zev will probably post it on his as well. Where can people see what you're about uh, and get in touch with you if needed? Well, if people are wanting to learn a little bit more and find out a bit more about uh, what I do, they can contact us via the website, which is warrioratlaw.com. And if you've got Telegram on your phone or your computer, I have a Telegram channel as well, which is also called Warrior at Law. And we post a few videos, talks and various information up on there. And it's a great way if people need to get in touch to us and reach out to us for some more one-on-one -on -one help, best to do that via the website and we can get in touch with you via there if you are in need of help. And uh, one of the things that we'll chat about after as well, Zev, is uh, we've got a common law group here in Cairns. It's on Tuesday. People can get in touch with me, Dennis Two Ends at Awakening in Health. And uh, we're looking at uh, getting you, you up to do a workshop and to maybe uh, teach some people how to how to uh, get around some of these, to navigate through some of these these tricky situations. Um, again, just to close this little part out, Zev, uh, I'll, 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 I'll round up this little bit. But uh, for anybody who's listening, thank you very much, Zev, for uh, sharing your views and opinions with the listeners of Cannes FM 89.1 here. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll continue talking after this.